picking on Jeff, Jeff this evening. All right. Okay, so let's do a brief review. We're not going to go through everything, of course, that we talked about last week, but just kind of get a feel for where we're, we're going with this. And we're going to continue this, this concept by addressing the, the Spirit's relationship with the church. Um, there are kind of different aspects to this that we're going to, to work through, but we're just going to look at a bunch of Scripture, like we've been doing, and just see what the Scripture says about this matter. So Matthew chapter 3, if you remember that passage, that was a, a very important passage for our study because it introduces us to what John calls the... Uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's a that's an important passage to kind of think about. And uh, when when John says it, we don't really know what it means. He doesn't really clarify. Um, but later on in the text, we begin to get bits and pieces a little bit more. And then when Jesus in Acts chapter one zeroes in on it, he's going to quote that passage or talk about John's words, and that really seals the deal for us as to what John is talking about. Uh, That would be John the Baptist, uh, John the Baptizer. But if you recall in Luke 24 and 49, this was another passage that was really important for our study, especially since it connects Luke's two different works, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, both written by Luke. And so it kind of connects us together, and it says, Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. You remember how that wording was, that there was going to be a sending of someone or something, and of course we know it's someone, Um, but uh, that that idea that that when Jesus um, ascends into heaven, that he's going to descend uh, a representative in his place to help the church. And um, if you've read through the book of Acts, you'll see that the Spirit does a lot of work with the church, a tremendous amount of work with the church, and just a a number of wonderful, miraculous things that happened that allowed the church to grow and persevere, gave the apostles the ability to speak the words of Jesus and bring about that message. So it's it's a huge thing that the Spirit is going to accomplish. Um, But Jesus makes this statement, the promise of my Father upon you, But then remember, it's the same command he's going to give in Acts chapter 1. Stay in the city or stay in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. Um, So that that concept of being being clothed with power, all of these are just analogies or illustrations to talk about an event um, that really, how do you describe? I mean, there's not really an easy way that anybody could really describe exactly what's going on. Um, but we have these these illustrations that are given to us to kind of help us see um, what's happening here. Now, Acts chapter 1, then again, Jesus will take those two passages, the passage from Matthew 3 and the passage from Luke, of course, the words of those people, obviously, um, but he will put them together as he speaks to his disciples, and he's encouraging them, and he's talking to them, and He's telling them that he has to go and all these things he's going to be talking about. Um, But their encouragement, their strength, comes from the fact that when Jesus does indeed go, that they won't be left alone. That's that's the encouragement they have. Um, They've been with Jesus all of this time. They're they're very concerned about um, Jesus' departure, just as they were concerned about, obviously, Jesus going to the cross They don't know exactly what's going to happen, um, and Jesus reassures them or gives them comfort to say, you you wait here in the city, and you wait for, and look how the wording is. Uh, He says, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. So that's that's where our Luke 24, 49 text comes into play. And then he says, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So there's our Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11 passage that's being brought into into the text. So Jesus quotes both of those passages, and he's relating it to something that's going to happen. Something that will happen shortly. It's going to happen in Jerusalem. It's going to be something that's going to come pretty quick. Um, Evidently and obviously there will be power uh, manifested. And so there will be evidence 
Um, the Spirit's not going to come secretly and mysteriously, um, but He will come with power. He will come with evidence. They will be able to see and witness, and not just they, but even the people on the street are going to be able to hear what's going on in the upper room as the Spirit uh, falls upon these apostles uh, like tongues of fire. And so he will manifest himself to them, but he's going to, people are going to hear it. Uh, so it, it's not something, then again, that people questioned. You know, it was, it was not something that people said, well, well, was that the Spirit or was that the Spirit? You know, it's going to be something that's going to be very evident. Um, there's going to be a tremendous amount of evidence to support uh, this event. Um, of course, not to mention that the apostles are now going to be able to speak in other languages, and the people who are there are going to be able to hear the apostles speak. So all these languages are going to be able to communicate with one another. All these people are going to be able to communicate with one another. And uh, that is going to be pinnacle in, in spreading the gospel message, um, to be able to communicate with all people of all nations uh, in their own tongue is going to be um, a huge asset for the church as the church spreads throughout the world um, and, and begins to do its work. Uh, now that the Spirit has arrived, that's, that's the event that we've been talking about. It, it, it has happened. The Spirit has come. Um, Acts chapter 2, we see it. Uh, we see the power. We see the, the manifestation of the Spirit. We see um, all that has been spoken of. And even, even Peter gets up and he says, you know, all that you're seeing right now, this, this was prophesied. Um, do you remember what, what prophet he quoted? Anybody? Joel, yeah, Joel, the prophet Joel, Joel chapter 2, and God would pour forth his spirit on all flesh. And, and Peter gets up and he says, see, this is it. Uh, this is what we've been waiting for. This is what we have been waiting for. Um, and so then again, what is the spirit going to do? I mean, what what work will he do? How will he accomplish that work? What benefits will take place? So Let's, let's kind of follow that pattern. Let's follow and trace the Spirit's work and see what's going on. So the first one, of course, is Acts 2.38. We're very familiar with this passage, but it, it is the first time we hear of the Spirit's um, uh, being in somebody or the Spirit uh, indwelling somebody, although the language doesn't actually come up in this text. We kind of get that image, this idea that somebody is going to receive the Spirit. Um, so Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter says to them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive what? Right, the gift of the Spirit. Okay. Now this is where it sometimes gets a little confusing because um, that same phrase is used again for, for something else, and we gotta got to talk about that. Um, but in this case... We recognize that everybody at this point who hears the words of Peter, obeys the words of Peter, will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that would be the, the Spirit as a gift. Um, that's how that seems to work. At least that's how I view that passage. But if you remember from, from Acts chapter 11, do you remember when Peter has to go before the other Jews and he has to explain why he's baptizing Gentiles? And because uh, they're asking some questions about this this household, this uh, family of Cornelius, and in his explanation he says, "Well, they they saw an angel, they saw a vision, and that that angel told them to send to Joppa and bring Simon, who was called Peter." So, you know, Peter's kind of retelling this story, uh, and then and then he says that he that would be Peter would declare uh, to you Cornelius and his household. Uh, the message by which they will be saved, um, he and his whole household. And so that's, that's the idea. So we have this family um, that maybe they've heard stories, maybe they're, they're wondering what's going on, they're recognizing that things are happening, they're seeing prophecy being fulfilled. Yes, they're Gentiles, but they seem to have, and the text suggests that these are righteous people in the sense that they want to do right. Um, they want to do right. They want to follow God. They, they want to be uh, followers of God. And at this point, they probably have heard some rumors. You know, there's, there's word on the street that something's happening. There is this group that has started to grow 
in Jerusalem, and it's beginning to spread out. And Cornelius wants to know what, what, how he can be part of that. How can I be part of that? And so he's told um, that you need to call for this person, this apostle. And when he comes, he will, he will preach to you the message that you need to hear in order to receive salvation. And so that's, that's how that worked. And so the, the Spirit gives Peter the message uh, by which they must be saved. And those who obeyed would receive the gift of the Spirit. Um, that's how that, that worked. And so thinking about that and kind of putting that out idea together, this, this is going to be a pattern that's going to be repeated over and over and over again where people hear the message, they obey the message, and they receive the Spirit as a gift. Um, that, that's, that's the pattern. That's what we expect. Right? I mean, we expect that. Um, it's not that we see tongues of fire, and it's not that we hear noise, but, but how do we know? How do we know that we've received the Spirit when we were baptized? What is it that, that helps us to understand that? Well, how do we know? It's by what? Starts, what's that? Feel it. Feel it, Okay. All right, feel. I was going to say it starts with an F, but then you came up with feel it, so that, that didn't work out. All right, so it's another word that starts with an F, all right? Um, it's by what? Faith. Right, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So God told us, and that's all we need, really, right? I mean, we don't really need anything else, per se, but we need God's promise um, that we have in Acts 2.38, you know, those who repent and are baptized for the remission of their sins, will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's all we need. And so that pattern is repeated over and over again. Um, then again, that is, we might call that a result of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Um, a result of. So the Spirit has come. Peter is given the ability to speak the words that lead to salvation. He does. And gives a promise that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But he also gives another promise that when they're baptized, what else happens? I'm sorry? Everlasting life. Yeah, they're forgiven, right? Forgiven of their sins. That's what the part of that promise is. So there are two promises that come along with the words that they need to hear. Um, that if they repent, they believe, repent, be baptized, that they will receive forgiveness of sins, everlasting life, they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those are the two promises. Um, of course, then again, it's the forgiveness of sins. That's not a, a thing that we can really just see. You know, We cannot witness our sins being forgiven. But how do we know? How do we know our sins are forgiven? Yeah, yeah it's hell. He told us, right? It's, it's by faith, right? We, we believe um, that when Peter spoke these words that he was speaking on behalf of God, and therefore we know. So then again, this, this receiving of the Spirit as a gift is a result of the Spirit having come. And, and that's how that, that seems to manifest itself. Um, there's lots of ways the Spirit has functioned with people in the past. Lots of ways. He's obviously given people the ability to speak the words of God through prophecy. And um, he's given them visions He's given people power. You know, he's done all of these things before. He has been upon kings. Um, he's anointed kings. He's been with kings. He's given them wisdom. Um, he's done all these miraculous things. This is, is unique. Uh, this is unique. Because up to this point, we, we don't have people receiving the Spirit as a gift like this. This is unique. Um, it's unique to the church. It's unique to the church. And so we need to recognize it as being something that's unique. Um, Acts chapter 5 and 32, this is some more of, of what we're talking about, but it says, and we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who, what? Obey, obey him, right? So that's the idea, is that those who obeyed the words of Peter received the Holy Spirit. Um, but then you remember John chapter 7. I don't have it on the screen, but remember John chapter 7? 
whenever Jesus stood up and he said, he who thirsts comes to me and I will give, you know, that kind of an idea in, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And John says that, that when Jesus said this, he spoke of who? The Spirit, who had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been, what? Glorified, right? And so Jesus being glorified, he sends the Spirit. But in that context... He says the Spirit would be given to all who believe, right? Because that's really John's, John's main theme is the belief in Jesus. But here in this passage, the words are spoken in such a way that it's, yes, of course, it's, belief is implied, but it's the ones who obey. So now we have belief and obedience. Um, obviously, that would be the, the um, ideal response to anybody who heard the words of Peter, that they would both believe and obey. Um, those two have to go hand in hand. They cannot be separated from one another. Um, obviously, a person cannot just obey without belief because belief is necessary for our salvation. And if a person believes, hears, but doesn't obey, then that's called disobedience, right? So that's, that's not part of it. It's all of those who heard the words of Peter believed, and of course, that not only the words of Peter, but they had to also have believed in who? Jesus and his redemptive work. And they obeyed the words of Peter. They would receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what seems to be here. All who um, obey are given, given the Spirit. So the, the, this believer-spirit relationship um, is what we're going to, to see throughout throughout the rest of the text, this concept that everybody who has believed and been baptized in water for the forgiveness of the sins receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and now what's unique about this, or what we need to understand, is for that, the, the receiving of the Spirit as a gift, there's, there's not a gap anywhere in the text. There's nobody who um, is baptized, and then it doesn't say, you know, three weeks later they received the Spirit as a gift. That's not how that, that worked. Um, however, there are those who were baptized, they believed, they obeyed, they received the Spirit as a gift, and then later received gifts from the Spirit. You see the distinction? <laughs> it's an important distinction, okay? There is the Spirit who is a gift to all who believe and obey. And then there are gifts from the Spirit, it's a very important distinction that needs to be understood because otherwise you read through Acts and you can become incredibly confused <laughs> because of the way the language works. But understanding that distinction, I think, is, is really, really important. So the Spirit's work in our salvation, let's talk about that. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. It says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. All right. And before we even comment on that, let's look at some other passages that talk about talk about that very thing. Okay, this is Ephesians chapter one, verse thirteen. Paul says, "In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, remember that's our that's our pattern." We hear the message of truth that was given to the apostles by the Holy Spirit, the message of salvation, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, which of course automatically implies what? That they believed in what? What naturally has to come with that? Obedience, right? Right? I know it's it's when we have meals on Wednesday nights, it's like everybody is lethargic. I understand that. I get it, especially when it's biscuits and gravy. I mean, man. So naturally, we understand, and that's what that's what we talked about in Acts chapter five as well. Remember that those who obeyed received the Spirit; those who believed received the Spirit. It's it's, it's the idea that that they go hand in hand. There's not a separation um, when it comes to salvation. Now, obviously, a person can believe and then not do anything with that. We have several examples in the Gospels of people believing that Jesus is Lord, but because of fear, they don't do anything. They don't respond. 
They just believe, but they don't respond. And we have several cases, especially in the Gospel of John, that talk about people who heard Jesus speak, believed Jesus, believed that he was the Messiah, and chose not to follow him because they were afraid of the Jews. So we have lots of cases like that. Um, we have no case that I'm aware of of a person obeying Jesus, having not believed first. That's not. We don't have an example of that. Um, but we we understand that when somebody comes to believe in Jesus, believe in the message of salvation that Paul's talking about, they naturally have to respond with an act of obedience, just like Peter talked about in Acts two thirty eight. But he says those who believe, they were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, one more, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. All right? So, the Holy Spirit is the seal, and the Father is the sealer. He's the one who seals. And if you can imagine, uh, of course, we don't use these anymore, but you know, uh, you might see them in movies and stuff, especially medieval type movies where they have um, a hot uh, iron type object, and they they would uh, take and melt the wax onto a, an envelope or something, you know, to seal it. Um, that way, if you were passing information around, you know, especially if it were from one king to another, some very important documents, when they received those documents, they knew that that was that was not tampered with. It was still pure. Nobody had altered it because that seal had not been, been broken. Uh, and that's, that's basically the idea of what, what um, these texts are talking about. Paul talks about the Holy Spirit as a seal. So God seals us um, for a day in which we will be revealed or exposed or whatever language you would like to choose from Paul's theology, um, but we're sealed for the day of redemption, and the Spirit is the one who is the seal. We're marked, we're stamped, we're sealed. It's a con confirmation of authenticity, um, that we belong to God, and that uh, we have um, that sense of, of purity. We haven't been tampered with. God has sealed us for the day of redemption. That's, that's the general idea, okay? Now, the passage or the word, other word that has come up several times is that word pledge, right? 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. So all of this is as a result of, you know, the Spirit having come. That's why we spent so much time on that. The Spirit has come, and now those who believe and obey receive the Holy Spirit as a gift, which the, Paul calls a seal for the day of redemption. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, he says, For how um, now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Now that word's come up before, but it's the idea of, of uh, you know, giving somebody a pledge. We, we see words like earnest come up, earnest money, you know, to, to pledge something to somebody. Um, that the Spirit acts as a pledge that God is going to redeem you, that God is going to rescue you, that God is saving you. And that's the function of the Spirit within the Christian is to say, you belong to God. You are sealed. Um, the Spirit is a pledge of my plan for you to redeem you uh, when that day comes, the day of redemption. Now let's go back to Ephesians 1.14. It says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, right? And then, then we come into that concept of eternal life and being with God forever and having um, those kind of ideas, this view that Paul says to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So the Spirit acts as a pledge of our future inheritance, that we have something to look forward to. Um, when you were baptized in, into Jesus, you were forgiven of your sins and you received the Holy Spirit as a gift. That spirit, that gift, is a seal from God, and that gift is a pledge from God um, to say that, that God will redeem you. God will follow through with his promise. He will bring his promise to a realization. Um, 
Now, this analogy may not make a lot of sense to everybody. I hope it makes sense. Um, it makes sense to me. This is how I kind of think about it, and I've heard it spoken before, and I, I thought, man, that's, that's how this thing works. Um, but if you think about computers, I know just the sound of that word, you know, it's computers. But, you know, you think about computers, computers come in two parts. Of course, there's the hardware, right? And what's that? That's the PC, the monitor, the keyboards, all that stuff. You know, that's the hardware, that's the actual thing that you pay for and buy and put in your, you know, in your house or office or whatever. Uh, but then you also have to purchase something else because the hardware has no value unless it has what? Anybody know? Software, right? I mean, if you don't have software, the hardware is useless. And so you got to have software to, to run, run the programs. Um, so you might think about it this way. The Spirit... Is, is part of our redemption. He's part of our resurrection. He's part of our renewal. Um, he's the software. Okay, We've been given the software. What are we waiting for? The hardware, right? Um, he's, he's someday, because we have the Spirit, because we have the software, someday God is going to, to resurrect us and we will receive the hardware. That's what we're waiting for. That's our expectation, that's our anticipation, that the software has come, but our resurrected bodies are still waiting for us. And God has pledged that to us. He has sealed us for that day. He has, he's preparing us, and the Spirit is part of that work, which we receive ahead of time. And we're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. Um, so our expectations, you know, thinking about what our expectations are, our expectations as recipients of the gift of the Spirit lies in our future hope. It lies in our eternal life. It lies in our resurrected bodies. Um, our expectations lie in the inheritance um, rather than any kind of ability um, because that's not really what Paul's talking about. He will address that, yes, later, but right now he's just talking about the fact that, that all believers... All who belong to Jesus have the Spirit. And that is, that is like I was saying, the, the software, and we're waiting for the hardware. We're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. That's what we look forward to. Um, of course, some other things that we, we can talk about when we're addressing the work of the Spirit in the church. Because the Spirit had a lot of uh, things that he did for the church. Um, things that were very evident. Things that were witnessed by many people. Um, in, in fact, if you remember Simon the sorcerer, when he witnessed Peter laying his hands on the Samaritans and they received power from the Spirit, remember he was impressed. He was amazed by that uh, to the point where he was willing to purchase it if that were even available to him. And so there was something very evident. So let's take a look at that, that passage. Of course, we have to understand this is after Acts 2. So Peter has already spoken those words. There were people being baptized, and when they were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, what else did they receive? The Holy Spirit is a gift, a pledge, a seal, a um, sign of their inheritance. Okay, so here we have Acts chapter 8. It says, Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, uh, they sent to them Peter and John, um, who, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we know, right, from other passages of Scripture, that those who believed, those who obeyed, immediately received the Spirit as a gift. Okay, we, we know that. The text has already implied that. We've read those passages. Um, so this receiving of the Spirit is going to be, is not going to be the same thing as the indwelling of the Spirit. It, we, those categories need to be... Firmly set, okay? Everybody received the Spirit as a gift. Everybody sealed with the Spirit who belongs to Jesus and been baptized for the remission of your sins. Everybody has that pledge. That was for everyone. Um, but what we see in Scripture is not everyone received gifts from the Spirit. Now, many people did, especially in the first century. I mean, lots of people did. And it was a beautiful thing. It, was, it, was, um, it would have been just wonderful to see the work that took place with the power of the Spirit manifesting himself in the lives of these apostles and these uh, believers. But that's what we're talking about. So Peter and John are sent because these have been baptized into Jesus. They've received the Spirit. 
but they haven't received any any power. Um, so they're, that's what the idea, or that's what the purpose of this is. But look at verse 16. He says, for he had not yet fallen on any of them. <laughs> that There's our, another phrase or word that we hear frequently, even through the Old Testament, that the Spirit falls on people. And when he does, he often gives them power. He often gives them abilities. Um, he fell on Samson many times to give him strength and power. He fell upon kings. He fell upon prophets. He fell upon Elijah and Elisha. He's fallen on many people. But when we hear that language being used, we assume that he is going to empower them. Then again, I sound like a broken record, but it's not the same as the indwelling of the Spirit that seals us. That's a different idea. So the Spirit had not fallen on any of these who had been baptized into Jesus, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they hadn't received any powers. Okay, And he says, then they, they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Um, and that, that's, that's basically the idea, is they're, they're empowering them, they're giving them gifts. So they can go out and do the work that the church was called to do. Um, and it's a very wonderful thing. But these are saved people. They belong to Jesus. They belong to the church. They receive the Spirit as a gift. They have the pledge. They have the seal. They have all of that because they were baptized in the name of Jesus, right? But they had not received any, any power. And the apostles had the ability to come and lay their hands on people because all throughout the scriptures, they're the only ones that had that capability to, to lay their hands on somebody, and the Spirit would empower um, that person with a gift um, for the benefit of the church. And that's, that's also key. So 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about this because the church in Corinth has some issues, right? They have lots of issues, but they particularly have some issues about their gifts, and uh, they seem to be putting themselves in positions of authority based on the gift that they received. That seems to be the issue. So they're having some problems even with the gifts of the Spirit. And then 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, To each, Paul says, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterances of wisdom. Right? So he's talking about the individual people receiving different, different gifts in the church. And to another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith uh, by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. And then in verse 10, he says, um, And to another, the working of miracles. And to another, prophecy. And to another, the ability to distinguish between the spirits. Those are spirits often mean communication. It's like that idea, you know, to, to know whether the spirit is speaking or some other spirit is speaking. To another various kind of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Um, so that, I think those are, those are key verses to talk about what they experienced. So the church in Corinth is an example they, um, at the laying on of the apostles' hands, they received gifts. And Paul says that, you know, not everybody has the same gift. I mean, here's a list of all the gifts that you possess. You know, one of you has this, one of you has this, one of you has that. Um, but all gifts are given by the same Spirit. It's the same Spirit who gives the gifts. Uh, and they may think, well, I'm more important than you because I have this gift, or I'm more important than you than I have that gift. You know, but Paul says that it is the Spirit who makes that choice, that he gives to each individual as he wills. And so they didn't even have a choice. You know, it's not like Paul could go up to somebody and say, and I will give you the gift of healing and lay his hand, you know, unless he knew ahead of time that that's the gift they were going to receive. He couldn't, couldn't force that. Um, but the Spirit made that choice. Yes, ma'am. In Acts chapter 8, yes. Philip was an, um, he was the deacon from Acts chapter 7. Yeah, different Philip. Philip the evangelist. We call him Philip the evangelist, yes. Different Philip. 
Yeah, I know that gets confusing also. Yeah. There's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of terms, there's a lot of names. Yes, that's why he couldn't, but Peter and John could, and that's why they were called to do so. All right? So Peter lists all these different, different gifts that the church would receive. Um, so a couple of ideas. Let's kind of walk through these for just a moment. Um, the gifts were given by the will of the Holy Spirit. I think that's important. We have to understand that. Nobody chose those gifts. Nobody asked for specific gifts. The apostles couldn't give certain gifts um, on, of their own will, but the, but the Spirit made that choice. Because the Spirit intimately knew the church, and he knew what the church needed. And he knew what each individual needed to have in order to, to uh, do the work of the church. Now, the purpose of that was for the common good. right? It's for the benefit of the church. It's benefit of the brethren. Um, although they are using it to, to go against one another and fight with one another, Paul is making it clear that, no, no, these gifts are designed to be for the common good. Um, they're designed to benefit you. Um, because there were certain things that they didn't have. You know, other than the letters from the apostles, um, they did not have uh, the Bible that we have today. You know, they, they started collecting the canon, but this is pretty early on in the church, so they don't have much. Um, so they needed the ability to, to discern these things, to, um, to prove the word, to confirm the word, and, and that seems to be what that's, what's taking place with that. Okay. And now finally, the gifts were not a sign of one's salvation. These people are already saved, just like they were in Acts chapter 8. This wasn't a sign of their salvation, but it was given to save people. Okay. So just real quick, there's a distinction. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit that's given to everybody who believes and obeys. And then they were, there were gifts of the Holy Spirit that were only given to some um, by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Those are Two different, two different ideas. Um, here's, a, here's an example. Acts chapter 19. It'll be our final example. Let's go ahead and we'll wrap up with this example. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the, the inland country and came to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Because we've already talked about how that works. And they said, No. We haven't even heard there was a Holy Spirit. So these folks are really kind of out in left field in regards to the work of the Holy Spirit. So that brings up a lot of questions for Paul. And he says in verse 3, and he said, into what were you baptized? Right? You know, I mean, if, if you were disciples, if you were immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, and you don't know about the Holy Spirit, you know, into what were you baptized? Uh, and they said, into John's baptism. Well, that explains everything, because John did not promise um, the indwelling spirit at his baptism. That wasn't part of John's baptism. That was part of Jesus' baptism. Um, so into John's baptism, Paul said John baptized uh, with the baptism of repentance. Remember, he was calling the Jews to repent and follow Jesus, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. So these, these baptized disciples of Jesus had not received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because they were baptized into John's baptism, and they didn't even know about a Holy Spirit. They didn't believe, they didn't have faith that they would receive the Spirit. Um, they didn't even know they would. They knew nothing about it. And so Paul picks up on that, and he says, well, <laughs> that was John's baptism. That's not what that was for. But there is another baptism, the baptism of Jesus, in which case people receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that you're supposed to be listening to. It's Jesus, uh, not John. So the next verse is verse 5. He says, On hearing this, they were baptized. Now we can, we can add the word again, obviously, because they were immersed in water again, but this time in the name of the Lord Jesus. So this would be the baptism that Peter preached about in Acts chapter 2. And this time they know that when they are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, what would they receive? Holy Spirit as a gift. So now they know. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, so they were baptized, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and now the Apostle Paul is going to lay his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, fell on them, came on them, all that language. And they began to speak in tongues and prophesying, and there were about 12 men in all. So 
just to kind of wrap this up. So we all receive the Holy Spirit as a gift, as a pledge, when we were baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. We are now children of God. We belong to God. God has sealed us. He has put his software in us, if you want to think about it that way. We are temples of God. We are a temple of God individually and collectively as the Spirit dwells within us. God dwells within us. Um, however, all the apostles have gone. Right? They're all gone. They've, they've already passed from this life. Um, these miraculous gifts that the Spirit gave in the first century to the Christians that they're laying on of the hands of the apostles, um, that obviously has, has changed because of what we see in the text. Um, what they experienced was very evident. It was very evident. People knew it. They saw it. They understood it. Um, it was for the common good of the church. And, um, but there came a point when that wasn't necessary anymore. And the apostles would die, and they could not lay their hands on, on the, um, the disciples. And so what we do have, however, um, is not something that we expect to manifest with power, but we have something that we expect to receive by faith. It is a hope. It's an expectation, right? That because God has given you his spirit, that our salvation is secure, that when you die, because you have the Spirit of God, your death is not going to be the final thing, right? That God will redeem you. God will raise you from the dead. That he will resurrect you. And then you will be redeemed. And the Spirit was involved in Jesus' resurrection. The Spirit will be involved in your resurrection. And then we will, we will be raised to live eternally with God forever. Um, and that's, that's the story. It's the story. It's a beautiful image, but that's the hope we have in Jesus. Let's have a word of prayer for our close. Let's pray together. Father, we are so incredibly thankful for all that you have done through Jesus, through your spirit. Father, we recognize that the, the power we see in the scriptures and the power that we know that you have, Father, we understand that that power has always been for the benefit of your people. Father, help us to, to recognize that within us, Father, those of us who have believed and have been baptized, that within us is the Holy Spirit of promise. And that because of that, Father, we have the hope of everlasting life with you. Thank you for all that you have blessed us with. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your son. Thank you for salvation. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.